Aloha, this is Professor Porter. We're talking about the federal rules of evidence and, and hearsay. And we're still in hearsay defined, but uh, what we're moving on to today is some of the responses from the proponent. Of course, the opponent starts out in a familiar way where they say objection hearsay, thereby invoking the 801C definition out of court statement for the truth of the matter asserted. But now, as it relates to the arguments for the proponent, when it gets back to the response, the proponent was the one, of course, likely engaged on direct examination of questioning, uh, trying to elicit a statement. The objection was uh, was lodged during the middle of the examination. They make their way over to sidebar. The proponent has something to say. Of course, they can argue in this far left panel. They can argue the definition uh, and say, you don't have the one, two, three. You don't have an out of court. You don't have a statement. You don't have that bad purpose of truth of the matter asserted. But another move that we'll talk about in this middle panel today, and before we get to the all the exceptions uh, in 803, 804, and 807 uh, in the far right panel, is when it's not hearsay defined or sometimes called uh, hearsay exemptions under the rule. So 801C has the definition of the objection for the opponent. 801D has a whole separate set of definitions essentially when it is not hearsay defined. And if the proponent can meet out the foundational requirements, the elements for something that's not hearsay defined, prior and consistent statements, prior IDs, or what we're gonna talk about here today, statements against parties, uh, then essentially they'll overcome a hearsay objection because they'll be able to articulate that they have their own foundational requirements, that they've met the elements of not hearsay defined and therefore the objection should be overruled and the evidence should be allowed or admitted. So keep in mind, these are all the directions that the proponent can go in these three white boxes. It's not hearsay that it doesn't meet the deposition. It's not hearsay defined under 801D for one of the reasons, or it, while it may be hearsay, an exception applies. Today we're talking about statements against parties. So once you get past the definition of uh, arguing about the definition that uh, the opponent would lodge, then you can go into three pretty bright line categories of not hearsay defined under 801D. Uh, the one we're going to talk about today is statements by party opponents, but notice out of court identifications. You see it in TV and the movies all the time of looking through the one way glass and and pointing to the person that did it. That, of course, happened out of court. Uh, it's conduct, but it's assertive conduct because by pointing at number three in the lineup, the victim of a crime or another witness in a crime is essentially saying in parentheticals, that's the person that did it. That's what they mean by their conduct, plus the intent uh, to communicate a statement. So it's a statement. It's out of court. And of course, they need it for the truth of the matter asserted. The prosecutor is, is likely a criminal case. The prosecutor is introducing it to show that parenthetical, that person did it. So the identifications um, uh, need a not hearsay defined. Out of court identifications, you would essentially say uh, there's witnesses on the stand, they're subject to cross-examination, and they're introducing an out of court identification. We meet the foundational requirements of not hearsay defined. And we'll have separate videos, of course, that also talk about prior inconsistent statements uh, when it happens under sufficiently reliable circumstances like at a deposition or other time when it's under oath uh, subject to cross at the time or prior consistent statements as a uh, to rebut a charge of recent fabrication to essentially a charge that someone's not telling the truth someone's lying we can offer a predated consistent statement to show that they said something uh, consistent earlier before that uh, motivation to lie. Today we're talking about statements by party opponents, which really is one of those areas, not hearsay defined, that is less about what's in quotes and more about who said it and who's offering it. Less about the information that's in quotes, more about who said it and who's offering it. It's a hearsay exemption, a not hearsay defined uh, option for the proponent that's based on a stopple. That is, someone said something, someone authored a statement, and it's going to be able to, as a matter of fairness, as a matter of equity, be used against them. It's not so much about what's in quotes or analyzing uh, what's in quotes. Who said it and who's offering it? So here are the foundational requirements, again, for the proponent. The foundational requirements for the opponent are always the same. Objection hearsay out of court statement 
the truth of the matter asserted. Then it goes to the proponent in response to that hearsay objection, breaks away from the direct examination, makes their way to sidebar to the court and says, Your Honor, this is a not hearsay defined situation. I have my own foundational requirements. And for this one, this, these are statements by party opponents under 801D2. And there's 801D2A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, 801D2A is the most popular and the most often tested because that's a statement by a party offered by a party opponent. B, C, D, and E, all capitalized, are when statements are attributed to a party under various circumstances and offered by a party opponent. So first, we look at the foundational requirements. Said by a party, offered by a party opponent. If it's a prior deposition statement by the plaintiff and it's offered by the defendant, it's less about what's in quotes and less about the circumstances of the statement, less about whatever was said. It's who is it said by? A party. Who is it offered by? Party opponent. Not hearsay defined 801D2A by the party. Okay. If it's a criminal case and the criminal defendant said something in the form of a confession after, but it doesn't need to be a confession. It could just be a statement that they, they have that is attributed to the defendant. The defendant said something at some point, said by the defendant, offered by the government, offered by the government as the party opponent, uh, done deal. It's not hearsay defined under 801 D2A. Uh, in a civil case, the plaintiff even after the initiation of the lawsuit, said something out loud that was recorded, said something to a reporter, said something on a TV show, said by the plaintiff, offered by a party opponent, the defendant at trial, 801D2A. Uh, it's less about what's going in it, what's in quotes. That's why I'm not covering the actual substance of the statement, the truth of the statement. It's about who said it and who's offering it at trial as an estoppel mechanism. And here you start to see how this rule breaks down. Party's own statement is the easy one. Party's own statement is the easy one. Is it said by a party? 801D2A, offered by a party opponent. Was it adopted by the party, authorized by the party, uh, by an agent of the party within the scope and, and during their employment or agency? And the last one is statements by conspirators that I'll devote a whole video to. So you can think about the circumstances, all these B, C, D, and E, which differs some from uh, certain state evidence codes. Uh, you really need to look at it and say, uh, was this a situation under 801D2C where a party authorize someone to speak on their behalf. If I sent someone into a meeting uh, for me and I said, as a proxy, I want you to vote this certain way on this measure that comes up during the meeting. You get to represent Porter. I authorize you to speak on my behalf. When item number 55 comes up, say yes. Uh, so they go into the meeting, they say yes. Uh, that too, that statement that's authorized by me, a party, and offered by my party opponent, if I'm the defendant in the civil trial, offer, offered by the plaintiff at trial, done deal, it's as if I said it. So not only my statements and the words that come out of my face, but also the ones that I explicitly authorize other people to sort of say things for me. Uh, same thing with an adopted statement. Uh, folks that uh, understand how attorneys operate for things like declarations and certifications, oftentimes, the, the words are prepared by someone else. The words are prepared by an attorney. Here's what your declaration is in, in support of this case. But once I sign it, once Porter signs it and I'm the party, I've adopted that statement. That statement becomes mine. So it's the same thing as if I said it. I'm, I've adopted a statement. Um, you can imagine in the corporate context when uh, if I had a, a public affairs officer or communications vice president who goes out to the podium and speaks to investors or speaks to the general public, they're an agent of the company. They're making statements on behalf of the company. They're making statements that are easily and understandably attributed to the company. Now, it's not all statements by all employees because it has to be within the scope of their employment. We're not going to let uh, someone who runs the parking lot speak for the company. Uh, and it has to be during, right? After the agency is over, after the employment is over, we're not going to let them speak for the company either. But very natural relationships where 
uh, you can imagine that we're authorizing you to speak for the company. Well, if the company is a party and it's offered by the party opponent, that too is going to come in. And you're going to see there's uh, a number of uh, foundational factors, foundational elements, foundational requirements that go to when uh, instances in a criminal case when a conspirator's statement can be attributed to a party as long as offered by the party opponent, most likely the government. So just think about these as foundational requirements that belong to the proponent. The proponent is responding to a hearsay objection and they're saying, I have my own foundational requirements for not hearsay defined under 801D. And it's either, it's a statement by a party under 801D2A offered by a party opponent or statement attributed to a party. 801 D2 B C D and E and offered by a party opponent. So really pay attention first as a checklist. First you're going through the definition of hearsay and where there's arguments to be made as to the definition of hearsay. Next, as the proponent when you're analyzing a hearsay problem, the next thing you want to look at is are there foundational requirements for not hearsay defined that are available to the proponent before you ever get to um, exceptions in 803, 804, and the residual exception of 807. And lastly, as the opponent, the one who threw the flag in the ring, the one who stood in opposition, the one charged with objecting, right? Uh, that person rightfully said objection hearsay, and they went to 801C, out of court statement, truth of the matter asserted. They did what they're supposed to do. As soon as the proponent makes an argument like this, your Honor, this is a an attributed uh, statement by a party opponent. This is 801 D2C. This is made by someone authorized to speak for the party, and it's offered by us, the party opponent. Uh, as soon as they make an argument like that, if I'm the opponent, the conversation narrows. I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to say, no, you don't have the foundational requirements for a statement by a party opponent attributed to a party opponent under 801 D2C. The person is not authorized or there's some issue with authorized or it's not offered by a party opponent. I'm going to attack those foundational requirements as the opponent. But no, if you meet as the proponent any of the foundational requirements under this rule 801 D2, either statements by a, a party opponents or statements attributed to party offered by party opponents, um, then the objection, the hearsay objection, the original start to this all is going to be overruled and the evidence is going to be allowed or admitted at trial.